Let's move to the next speaker, Sophie Amada from uh, Georges Pompidou, France, and uh, Paris. And we were going to talk about the uh, initial resuscitation goals. So thank you again, Sophie, for, for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I hope you have a coffee while listening to us. <laughs> um, so I thank also the organization for the invitation. And let's talk about the initial resuscitation goal in spinal cord injury. The first point is that a spinal cord injured patient is first of all a severe trauma patient. And it should be managed as a severe trauma patient. So he should be directed to the trauma center to benefit of a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, first of all, we have to address the life-threatening injuries, especially hemorrhagic shock, which is in the first, uh, in the front of the scene. And sometimes uh, you have conflicting targets when you have hemorrhagic shock, when you have uh, higher pressure targets for brain and uh, also spinal cord injury. And all of this should be done in the time-sensitive approach. So first of all, a severe trauma patient. Then when it comes to a spinal cord neuronal injury, it has some analogy with a traumatic brain injury. Um, at the moment of the impact, you have mechanical forces uh, creating immediate tissue disruption in the spinal cord, leading to primary injuries. And this is gathering all the contusions, hematomas, axonal injuries, for example. Then you have a, a set of secondary injuries, um, mostly from local uh, processes. So it's um, microvascular, biochemical, and cellular uh, processes. So that secondary insults from local origin, leading to edema, for example. And then you have secondary injuries uh, of systemic origin, which are the consequences mostly of the complication of the spinal cord injury. So to understand that, let's go back to some anatomy. Uh, all the muscles are uh, innervated all along the spinal cord. And you can see in, uh, in pink that the respiratory muscles are all along the cervical and thoracic spine. That's the first point. Then you, have, you can have an imbalance between uh, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system goes out at each stage uh, on each vertebra and innervating all the internal organs and especially giving vascular tone. So when you have a spinal cord injury, the main complication and life-threatening complication you have from the beginning are respiratory distress, and neurogenic shock, which is a distributic shock because you don't have any more the sympathetic tone on the vessels. So when it comes to early resuscitation goal, gathering what we said from the beginning, first of all, address the life-threatening injuries first and so stop the bleeding from outside bleeding and internal bleeding with pelvic belt, for example, following uh, European and uh, French guidelines uh, on the hemorrhagic shock. Then, when it comes to A, B, airway breathing, you should avoid hypoxemia to avoid secondary insults. So that's what Tobai said just before. Some patients need endotracheal intubation. Some patients don't need it from the beginning. At least you avoid hypoxemia, giving oxygen either with invasive uh, devices or not. When it comes to C, circulation, you have to address uh, traumatic induced coagulopathy as in any severe trauma patient having hemorrhagic shock, following the guidelines. And you have to give tranexamic acid uh, as early as possible, even in the pre-hospital setting, and within the first three hours. Then you have to address uh, the neurogenic shock, which is the imbalance between parasympathetic uh, nervous system and the uh, damaged uh, sympathetic system. And the guidelines said you should target a mean arterial pressure of 70 millimeters of mercury. So first of all, you have to give some fluid load because it's the distributive shock. You also 
should evaluate your volemia if you have hemorrhagic shock, and then you can give norepinephrine to get to the targets. When it comes to D disability, uh, your patient have a spinal cord injury, so might have fracture, dislocation, so he should be immobilized with neck collar, uh, immobilization while intubated, and also with a spinal board, uh, log roll uh, scrolling when you move the patient, always avoiding any displacement. From the early stage, you should have an evaluation of the level of injury with the American Society of uh, Spinal Cord Injury Association, Association, sorry. And as long as your patient is on the spinal board, you should really beware of pressure ulcer, especially if you wait uh, for the surgery, for example, because you, you're afraid your patient moves and uh, mobilizes his fracture, but you should really be aware of pressure ulcers. And then uh, your patient should have a multimodal analgesia as any patient. If he's complaining of pain, he should have uh, morphine. And also, uh, in some studies, show that uh, ketamine from the beginning could have a good effect on the spinal cord injured patient to avoid chronic pain and to have an anti hyperalgesic um, effect. So that is the package of the early resuscitation goal that we can uh, keep on discussing if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia. Thank you for your talk. Um, you talk a lot about the arterial blood pressure and... Uh, is it possible, like we do in traumatic brain injury, to monitor uh, something in the spine, like maybe an indicator to individualize the therapy? Do you have an opinion on this? Is there some proof in the literature? Um, maybe, have you seen something about that? Yes, this is the main problem. That means we are quite good now uh, in the evolution of uh, monitoring in the traumatic brain injury, but we are really, really far away uh, when it comes to monitoring uh, 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 neuronal injuries in the spinal cord injury. So some studies, and a recent one in critical care in 2014, uh, show that you can use probes in the spinal cord that you can put during the surgery to uh, monitor the um, intraspinal pressure. So once you have the intraspinal pressure, you can calculate your uh, spinal perfusion pressure, as you would do in the traumatic brain injury, so that your mean arterial pressure minus your intraspinal pressure. And uh, so that's a small study, but it shows you can do it. You have no problem putting the probes, no more infection, no hemorrhage, no, um, more, uh, no higher size of uh, hematoma in the, in the place uh, of the probe. And it's quite good to, to monitor in this patient, but it's too early to say that it can have an effect on the outcome of the patient. But we might be keep on going in studying these um, uh, this, um, methods of monitoring. Yes, thank you, Sophie. Um, I have could be a difficult question, so you will, okay, you will tell ready. me if it's... <laughs> uh, so um, should we have a look at the imaging to decide uh, how to set up the blood pressure. Uh, uh, for example, if you have a contusion with hemorrhage, there are some experimental studies showing that increasing the blood pressure in this case could be deleterious. Uh, however, if you have a compressive hematoma or a, a, a small canal it could be with edema, it could be interesting to increase blood pressure. So as for TBI, should we have a look at the imaging to decide if we increase or not the, the blood pressure? Thanks for this question, Thomas. I'm really happy. So you always should have a look at the injury <laughs> on the imaging. That's for sure. Afterwards, uh, let's stick to the guidelines. The guideline says you have to stick to at least 70 millimeters of mercury. But no one knows um, if you, go, you should go higher. For example, uh, the American Association of Neurosurgeons, they recommend to target between 85 and 90 millimeters of mercury, while in the UK, they, um, uh, they recommend to follow 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury of mean arterial pressure. 
So you can see that in between society, it's different. When, it's, when it comes to the injury, uh, some study, I know the study you're speaking about, it's an experimental study on rats, showing that if you resuscitate your rat uh, with a higher level of arterial pressure with norepinephrine, you have a higher size of hematoma afterwards. But <clears throat> in a human study, it's proven that if you have a laminectomy uh, in the surgery, and if you have a compression uh, with the bandage, you put up uh, the pressure higher. So you should be really careful in this kind of surgery of the bandage and uh, uh, the pressure. And it might be in this situation you can reflect of maybe pushing up a little bit your targets. But to give a really clear message and simple message, this is all experimental study and uh, this is research. But so far, um, if you try to do as the guidelines say, you still have to, to, to stick to the 70 millimeters of mercury. We, we really lack evidence uh, to say you have to go higher, even if we compare a lot with traumatic brain injury. And uh, I speak for me, but <clears throat> sticking to 70 for me is really hard because I want to go higher. But uh, when I look at the study showing that the hematoma uh, grew higher, it pushed me to, 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 to give more energy in the treatment of microagulopathy. Because in this study, it's really, really early uh, after the stage of the trauma, and you did, it, did not resuscitate with uh, um, your coagulopathy yet. It, it, so it's, so we, we can have many um, opinions as uh, experts. Uh, and um, I would say I would like to have a higher, a bit higher uh, arterial pressure. But so far, the guidelines say it's 70. And how long should we keep this uh, pressure high? Because uh, it's always a problem in the ICU. So you have always good threshold for the beginning, for the very early phase. But later on, whether you are in the ICU, how long should we keep the blood pressure high? or maintain it in the, in the range? So the literature on this question is uh, really, really scarce <laughs> and really light, but uh, the guideline uh, said you had to keep this uh, arterial pressure for seven days. And within all the society around the world, it's always the first week that you have to stick to a higher arterial pressure. But we really lack uh, um, evidence to, to say why seven days and not yeah. ten days and not five days. Nobody knows exactly. But yes? Yes. Some of the patients with uh, spin uh, spinal cord injury uh, only have a neurologic de cold defect. And sometimes there is a question after the surgery whether we should put the patients in the regular ward or in ICU. Should you recommend to always place this patient in ICU for blood for uh, arterial pressure monitoring and all the treatment in the early first days, or uh, can these patients go in a regular wards? Um, that's a good question. If you stick to the guidelines again, uh, you need an arterial blood pressure with <clears throat> eventually norepinephrine. But if your patient doesn't need a vasopressor to get to the right arterial pressure. Maybe you can let the patient to the ward if he's compatible with the ward, for example, for, uh, especially on the breathing situation. And uh, all uh, the uh, eventually other organ failures. Once you have addressed all the late resuscitation goal and you are sure you can let your patient in the ward, if he has a normal arterial pressure and you are within the targets, why not letting the patient in the ward? Okay, I would say that it also depends on the level of the uh, of the injury. If you have a cervical spine injury with a tetraplegia, so you have to, to go to the ICU. And if you only have a lumbar fracture with a low-level paraplegia, so maybe you can go to standard ward, I think. Of course, it depends on the clinic of the yeah. patient. But a patient with a cervical spine injury would be uh, clinically more, more impaired, impaired than a patient with a low paraplegia, of course. Okay, and... Just a question. Um, you say that trauma is a time-sensitive uh, um, uh, disease, so we have to always look at the time. And one of the best options to, to to decrease the time is to go to the direct to the to the good trauma center. If you make a wrong decision, the patient do, 
don't go directly to the trauma center, there is transfer, and transfer is always long and you lose time. So for the orientation of this patient, what is the triage on scene? Would you recommend everybody with a suspicion of spinal cord injury go to a trauma center? Can you be more precise about the indication of trauma center uh, at the, from the scene directly to the trauma center? So let's say that every severe trauma patient has a spinal cord injury until proven elsewhere. We know that. <laughs> so you can't bring every patient to the trauma center. So you have to, to, to find if your patient have um, elements, clinical elements, to, uh, to convince you that he has a spinal cord injury. For example, if he has transient signs of um, uh, paralysis, sometimes it happens, you say, oh, the patient couldn't move or have some paresthesia on the limbs and then it disappeared, this patient should be driven to the trauma center. Uh, the patient with uh, paraplegia, tetraplegia, this is uh, not the point. Of course, this patient should be driven uh, immediately to the, um, to the trauma center. But we sometimes have patients secondary transferred to the trauma center because uh, they didn't, uh, um, they were not uh, diagnosed, uh, for example, with paraplegia when they are um, with a lot of alcohol, for example, and we have the patient transfer secondarily, as this is probably a loss of change for this patient, uh, even if we lack uh, also um, evidence in the literature to say if you bring the patient with two or three hours late, this patient, especially with spinal cord injury, in the trauma center. But we know in the global population of severe trauma patients that if you don't bring them directly to the trauma center, it's a problem. So let's say, uh, yes, be careful on the clinical exam in the pre-hospital setting. Try to see if you have any sign of medullar injury um, and even if it's transient signs and bring this patient to the trauma center. Okay, I think it's really important what you say that even transient neurological sign is important to consider and this patient is probably having a spinal cord injury. I think this is a really good message for the audience. And last question. So if, can we treat or prevent chronic pain uh, at the early phase? Do you have any uh, uh, medication that we can give to limit um, the uh, chronic pain afterwards? Do you have a, an idea about what kind of medication can I give to the patient treating the pain and preventing? I would be very basic. Again, treat the pain as you, would, you would treat the pain on the classical severe trauma patient with uh, painkillers, morphine, but there are some uh, literature showing that if you give ketamine in this patient, you can avoid uh, a part of chronic pain afterwards. But be careful because it's different from neuro neurogenic pain, which uh, appears a bit later. And in the guidelines, it's proposed to give um, um, gabapentin and uh, also uh, uh, inhibitor of serotonin recapture in this patient once they present the signs of uh, neurogenic pain, not in prevention.